Hello my friend, it is your brother Hampton from Hybrid Calisthenics. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with Hampton where I sit down and share some thoughts with you over a cup of coffee. So a real quick one today on something that I think a lot of us need and would benefit from, but also a lot of us struggle with, which is forgiveness, forgiving others. Now this was something that I was somewhat resistant to at first. I grew up in the American Bible Belt and there was a lot of finger wagging um, from people telling me to forgive others. Usually, in my case, after they did something wrong to me. So in this case, I was resistant because they wronged me or we had a disagreement about something and I didn't think they were right and I was either punished or they did something that hurt me. And then they would bring up, oh, but you should forgive me. If you don't forgive me, you know, that's, that's bad. That's bad. You're not, you shouldn't do that. So I was resistant to it because <laughs> it didn't feel like they had that call. But eventually I came to realize that this is something that was very important and it wasn't something I was doing for other people. Learning to forgive others was one of the reasons why I could have the mental fortitude and the mental strength to be able to get through tough events like my mother's death and really just go through life the way I do now with the same peace of mind. Being able to forgive others can give us peace of mind. So that was really it. That was the key factor that convinced me and made me think that forgiveness and practicing our ability to forgive others was something important, very, very important to being able to succeed and thrive and be happy in life. Now that was a thing for me, I don't know if that's a thing for everyone else, but this idea that we're not forgiving others necessarily because of them, we're doing so because of us. Because I really ended up seeing a lot of my friends, family, and loved ones, a lot of them, they would have relationships that would fall apart and they were otherwise good friends and I'm friends with both of them, uh, with all of them, and I like them a lot but they just won't talk with each other. And a lot of them, they won't hang out anymore and they, don't, they won't do things with each other anymore because a lack of ability to forgive. And in some sense, yes, some people are so different that even forgiven, they should spend some time apart. But in a lot of times, in my opinion, no. As someone who's good friends with a lot of these people, I think they really could be good friends with each other had not like one or two things happened. And if they were, could let that go, then they could all really thrive and do better. And that's another thing. That's another thing that I had learned when people demanded, so to speak, demanded that I forgive them because of some religion or some moral reason, was I did not realize at the time, because they didn't tell me, that it was important to be able to forgive, but not necessarily to be able to forget, right? I'll give a very common example that I tell a lot of people, which is if I give you my baby to hold and you drop my baby, I might forgive you. Really? That's up to me. But even if I do, I'm probably not going to let you hold my baby again, right? You're going to be christened the baby dropper. You're Alex the baby dropper. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because I think it's wise to be able to learn from the mistakes of our past and apply it to our future decisions, including our past relationship with someone. And if we were just to forget that, to forgive and to forget, then that time and that experience may have gone to waste and you can't really use it to help yourself and can't really use it to help others. I know some people already disagree with this and say, and they're saying, Hampton, in order to truly forgive, you have to completely let it go and blank slate. I disagree. I disagree. And this is one of the reasons why I realized it was so important was I could still learn from my experience. And if someone really doesn't like it, then I would say, yes, I might be willing to give that person a clean slate, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. A metaphor I commonly use is that it's a lot faster and a lot easier, a lot simpler to cut down a tree than it is to grow one. Cutting it down can take as little as one second. Growing one can take years and years and years, sometimes lifetimes. So those were the two things for me that really made me realize how important forgiveness was and how applicable it was to my life. Just to reiterate, because it's very important for me, is one, I forgave others, not necessarily for them, but also for myself, for my own happiness and my own peace of mind and my own ability to move on so I can continue to evolve and thrive. And two, just because we forgive someone doesn't mean we can't learn from the ways they've wronged us and the ways we've been hurt. We can use that experience and apply it to our future decisions. And before I get into my personal method on how I forgive people, I just want to give some context. So 
I sat down and I thought of two primary examples, two ways where I needed to forgive someone, where I thought they had wronged me, and for both of these, I spent some time being upset. And I deliberately chose one that's kind of petty. It really wasn't that big of a deal, kind of, but this happened several years ago and you can kind of tell because I was younger, maybe a little bit more immature, and just the fact that I had latched onto it kind of might show some pettiness. And the next one is very serious. It involved my mother being sick and this was something where I did forgive the person but I don't think this is something like the previous example where I'll just mature beyond that and I realize it's not important because this was something that was a matter of life and death and it ended up being okay, but it's much more serious. And I'll try to get through all of this in one take just so I don't spend too much time because one of the side effects of letting this stuff go is I tend to forget some of the details because I don't spend time thinking about them. But the first one was back when I was in college. My major, international business, required a study abroad. So it was mandatory. And it was interesting because in our documentation, it said that this was a mandatory study abroad. You needed to do a study abroad to finish with a degree. And I went to Germany, by the way. But you also had to apply. So it was mandatory, they said you had to do it, but they also gave the option of denying you study abroad anywhere. So it was a little bit confusing for me, and I recognize a system like a college is hard to coordinate all the parts, but it was a little bit confusing for me, and I applied. And right away, I just, she might watch this, but this is fine, this is all true. My study abroad advisor, I think she was called at the time, study abroad advisor, just really didn't make it that easy for me. She really kind of just gave me difficulty at every turn. And in fact, during our first meeting, uh, we were talking about getting a recommendation from someone. And I was talking about wanting to study abroad here and here. And she just sat down and she looked at me and she's like, okay, hang on, hang on. Well, what's your GPA? Because you need a fairly high GPA to be, even be able to apply to some of these places. And I said, it's 4.0. And which was the max at my school. She said, oh, okay. And she kind of looked at me like she didn't believe me. Which, by the way, you know, grades aren't the absolute indicator of how smart <laughs> or not smart you are, but my grades happen to be okay. Um, but just one, it was, that's one of the examples. A lot of small things that I'm not even bringing up, but another one that stuck in my mind was when we were buying tickets to fly to Germany, uh, a lot of us did it through the school. She had some travel agent friend that supposedly could find tickets for cheaper and she recommended them by email and by word of mouth, just face to face and maybe other ways and she recommended them. And this supposedly would help students save some money and I spent some time by myself looking up tickets to see how much it would cost if I didn't use a travel agent and she said it would be cheaper. So I tried that and I tried this person. This person did give me a comparable ticket. I, I found one that was a similar price and she wanted me to meet her at this bakery in town. This was a travel agent recommended by someone at the school, by my study abroad advisor at the school. She wanted me to meet her at this bakery and give her, I think it was $1,500 and it was in cash. And I forget why it was in cash. I think maybe I didn't have a checking account at the time. Regardless, I don't not every college student has a checking account. So I gave her cash and it wasn't her that showed up. It was a man that I had never met before. It was an older gentleman who claimed to be her husband. And I gave him the cash. I asked him um, who he was and I confirmed what we were here, here to do. And I gave him $1,500 and he turned to walk away. I, I said, well, hang on, hang on, <laughs> hang on. Uh, can you give me a receipt or something? And he said, no, I don't have a receipt. I said, well, can you call your wife and ask her to email me? And he said, uh, she's taking a nap or something. She was indisposed at the time. And I was like, huh. Now, I don't know if everyone, this is immediately obvious to everyone, but at the time I was thinking, am I being scammed? <laughs> because anytime you give someone cash for something, that they don't give you something in return and they turn and walk away, there is a chance that you could be scammed because there's no record of anything there's no record of transaction, so they could just never see you again. So I believe at a time I called my travel advisor, who was supposed to assist me with this stuff, by the way. And I said, is this person 
really affiliated with the school. I just want to confirm, just calling, and I told her the story of it. And she starts going on this rant about how I need to listen and how, like, in order to thrive in life, in order to get through the study abroad program, I have to be able to follow instructions. You're supposed to advise me and help me, but uh, I follow instructions. And <laughs> I, I listened to it for a little while, and I kind of cut her off. I told her, look, here's why. And I told her, I was like, he wants me to give him cash and he's walking away with no receipt. And I just want to make sure I'm not getting scammed by someone else entirely. And that seemed to make her understand a little bit more. Um, but she just, just wasn't very pleasant the whole time. <laughs> That's the, I'm just going to summarize it like that. Even when I, was, when I was abroad and I needed some help, she just really didn't go out of her way to help me. And she kind of went out of her way to be unpleasant. I don't know why. And I just always remember that. And at a time, like I said before, you can kind of tell this is a little bit more a, a pettier version of Hampton because right now I have the inner peace to really, that, that really wouldn't bother me as much. I would still be wary, but I, that wouldn't bother me as much. But the entire time I was thinking, man, after I get done with the study abroad, because I, she, I, she has me under her thumb kind of, because if she just said, look, I don't think Hampton is suitable to go study abroad and he's not going, then she would have the power to stop me from doing a study abroad, which was required for my degree, which is interesting because I don't even know what I would do after that because you have to study abroad, but the school has to accept you for studying abroad. Um, and one of the things I told her was, was that, and she said, well, we don't make special exceptions. Uh, so I, I don't know. <laughs> but the entire time I was thinking, okay, okay, after I'm done, after I'm done, then I'm gonna leave her a bad review. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna think, like I'm, I'm gonna go on Facebook and say, so-and-so, is a person of very modest intelligence. <laughs> and then I'm, I, I was thinking about all the stuff I could do. And after I went through it, and I had a good time studying abroad, and I came back and I met a lot of friends, and it was nice, and it finally came time to do the review. It finally came time to do a review and experience, so to speak. Um, and I sat down, and I hadn't thought about it for a while, and I just put fairly satisfactory marks for everyone because I had a pretty good experience. And when it came time to comment on her, I gave some honest feedback. Th there could be a little bit more compatibility between the business department and the study abroad department, for example, so there's not as much confusing terminology. But overall, it was good, and I didn't leave a bad review. Moving on to the slightly, the much more serious example of where someone wronged me, and I'll spend less time on this because it is more serious. After my mom had her initial stroke, she spent about three weeks, I believe, in the ICU. After that, when it became clear she wasn't going to just wake up from and, and, and start doing stuff and be normal again, which is what they were monitoring her for, uh, they had to transfer her to something called long-term care. Now, long-term care means, I forget the definition, but it's like to several weeks to like two or three months. So it's not really long-term, long-term. Long-term care is just several weeks. So we transferred her to somewhere in town and we wanted to monitor her progress and see if she would improve. At the time, a lot of the medical staff and my father and I, we were still hoping that she'd be one of those cases where she goes to sleep, kind of like, the, she wasn't in a coma, but kind of those situations where you come in one day and they're awake and they're like, hi, boy, I was asleep for a while, what happened? And then I, we would work with her and we, we would cheer and we, <laughs> we would work with her to get better. And we, re, we were waiting for that all the time, the medical staff and my father and I. And my caseworker at the time, who was named Drew, I'm not gonna give a last name or anything, but her name was Drew. She just gave me an unpleasant experience during a time where I was probably, I was definitely more desperate than any other time in my life. Because even in the first example, if I really got upset, I was like, well, you know what? I don't even wanna do a study abroad. We'll see you later. But at the time I was so worried, so concerned, petrified of upsetting anyone at the hospital, even if they did something, did something wrong to me, I was worried about upsetting them because my mother's life was in their hands. And my family's close-knit. My family's close now. I was very, very blessed to have that. So I really loved my mom. And even if someone wronged me, I'd be like, okay, 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 I, I get it, I get it. Um, just please take care of my mom. I'm sorry for everything that I've done. And she, even from my first experience with her, she was, very down on the ability, on the possibility of my mother coming back. And just to fast forward, there eventually came a time to where she had to transfer out of long-term care and they had to transfer her to, 
I forget what they call it. Um, it wasn't a swing bed, but it's really the long-term care after long-term care. And it was very important that we found something in Arkansas. Arkansas was where we lived, is where we worked, is where we had all our family and our support system. So it was super important that we found her someplace she could stay in Arkansas, or at least nearby where we were so we could see her and visit her. And in my case, I was taking care of her full time, so I needed to actually be there. And I really met with her many times to try to get her a bed anywhere in Arkansas. And this woman repeatedly shot me down. She sent off different files to supposedly different hospitals and places that could potentially accept my mother. And she said, well, nobody accepted. And I was like, nobody accepted? She's like, yeah. And I said, but that's going to be very inconvenient for us if she has to be moved to like Tennessee or what was one they were talking about? It, it was like, it was very far away. It was like Oklahoma was a, close, was a closer one but they were talking like ones in Nevada and stuff. And it was just a very scary thing to hear at this time in my life. And I was like, really? There's nobody in Arkansas that can take her? And she said, no, there's not. And I was like, boy, that's confusing. It's confusing. And I met with her more times about different things. And I talked with other hospital employees and they were like, yeah, is your caseworker so-and-so? I'm like, yeah. They said, well, yeah, she has an issue. And I met with her boss at the time and we talked with, a little, talked with her a little bit. I don't think anything came of that. Again, you know, it's very easy to look at this now and, and for other people to say, well, why didn't you just report her? It's like, well, I could report her, but she still has a position of power in a place where my mother spends all of her time. What if, not even like someone will do something to my mother because I know that's a serious crime, but like what if as a result, she just doesn't go that extra mile to help my mother and help me uh, help us take care of her. So I was very, very careful. And towards the last few days, I was like, there's no way there's, <laughs> there's no way there's no bed that can accept her in Arkansas. So I started making calls myself and a lot of places that could have worked that could, that could have worked, I talked with them. They said, yeah, we could probably accept your mother and send over some paperwork. Then she, she hadn't even applied. The caseworker didn't even apply so my mother could get a convenient location. I don't know what it was. Someone said, this is just a theory. Someone said that it was because that caseworkers are often, they often have some kind of deal with other hospitals to where they can get some money if they get sent over there. This was hospital employees that told me this, by the way. I don't know about that. You know, that sounds like it could be the case, but I don't have proof of that. So I don't, you know, I don't want to look, pin that on her, but I don't know why, but she chose eventually someplace that was five hours away from where we lived, five hours by car. And we eventually made it work, but there were a lot of places that were closer that theoretically could have worked really well for us. Um, and she just hadn't called them. And for the places she had called, cause I, I went to her office and I said, hey, um, Maybe, maybe I could do some some work. Maybe I can help. Is there anything I could do to help? And she kind of rolled her eyes. She's like, eh, uh, sure, here you go. Um, you know, but they're not going to say anything. And I called different places. And some of the places that could have accepted her, where she did contact, because I asked her who she contacted, she had misrepresented my mother's case and made it seem like, for example, my mother was responsive in some cases, but not in other cases. And that was a determining factor in whether some some places would accept my mother. I know I'm rambling a bit, I apologize, but I just want to get through this. Um, and I even talked to some of the physical therapists and some of the nurses. So it wasn't just me, a lone patient, you know, going against, uh, she wasn't, she was trained as a nurse, but she worked as a caseworker. So it wasn't me going against the medical staff, you understand. I actually talked to the medical staff and they were very opposed to what she was doing. And eventually it came to a point to where she could make the decision whether or not my mother was allowed to stay here for, for a few more weeks, which would, would have really helped me find a place now that I knew she wanted me out right away. She wanted to throw us out at 8 a.m. the following day. We, follow, we filed an appeal and the appeal fell through. It was not accepted. And they said, you could file a separate appeal, but unless it succeeds, then you will have to pay several thousands of dollars out of your own pocket for your remaining stay. So it wasn't, I, you know, if you go to the hospital, they said, well, we can't toss patients out on the street. They weren't directly doing that, but because of her, they were indirectly doing that. So. That's kind of the thing, that's kind of the thing. At the time I was like, 
after I am no longer under this person's thumb, I am going to warn everyone. I, <laughs> I, I'm going to warn everyone. I'm going to leave a review on their Yelp. I'm going to leave a review on their Google business. I'm going to leave, I, I'm going to tell everyone about this. And I have told people um, in that area, in that city, that if they were transferred to this hospital, by the way, all the other hospitals were, they were nice. It was just this one person that to watch out, to watch out because I think it would help them. But I ended up not doing that, even though it might benefit other people. I might do that at some point, but at least for myself, I eventually let it go. By the way, um, eventually my mother transferred somewhere in Oklahoma. She stayed there for, I believe, several weeks. And then we finally managed transport to uh, get her home. And I took care of her full time, uh, like I had been for the past several months. I took care of her full time for a year and a half uh, where she eventually died in our home. Um, and that was last year, but it's in the past and it's a separate topic. It's a separate topic that I won't discuss too much here. But my, my experience with Drew was at the time, once again, she was in a position of power and I was in a position of no power at the time. Like I, I, was, I, was, I was very, very hopeful um, and prayerful that I could get my mother back and get her healed. And I was willing to do almost anything for that to happen. Uh, but it didn't happen. So when my mother eventually passed, I was, or even before, before she was, we were out of her jurisdiction. I was thinking, well, now I'm going to do this stuff. And eventually I let it go. Eventually I let it go. And while warning other people and leaving reviews so other people know, while that is a, a good and definitely a legitimate argument for why I should leave a review and tell other people, just for myself, which is what I'm talking about, what this video is about, why I let go of that was kind of, it wasn't a voluntary choice because at the time I was so focused on letting go of the past and just taking care of my mom in the present and getting her better that I really didn't, I didn't end up having that much time to dwell on the way, what things could have been because at the time I was thinking, this is the way things are. And I think my natural inclination to think that really does help me forgive because at any given moment, the way your life is, well, that's just the, the, the cards you were dealt. And you can complain about that, or you can play and think of a good solution and a good strategy to play with the cards that life dealt you. So at the time, I was thinking about what I could do, and that's really how it is ongoing. All the time I'm thinking about how can I maximize the present? How can I help more people with the things I've learned in the past? And there was that. And the second thing was something um, one of our coworkers told me, which is unsolicited, unsolicited, because I, I was like the, one of the hospital staff, all the nurses had heard my conversation with Drew at the time. And they had said like, wow, he was like, wow, like Hampton was really trying to think of different solutions and Drew just shut him down over and over and over again. And they were talking among themselves saying amongst themselves, among themselves, they were talking, <laughs> they were talking with each other saying, wow, like I, they didn't understand why Drew was that way. And someone came up to me and she's like, yeah, some people aren't very happy with themselves. And as a result, they kind of want to push that misery on others, which was something that I knew before. And, but I always remembered that. I always remember that as the way I phrase things. And I've said it before. Some people aren't happy with themselves. If someone is doing anything negative, anything from something small, like leaving a hate comment on a video, um, to something like this, oftentimes they're not happy with themselves and a hate comment is easier to forgive than someone at the time um, doing something that I thought was going to determine whether my mother lived or died. Uh, it's, there's obviously a, a big difference, but either way, it came from a place of them hurting themselves. And by the way, I'm, I'm not about to cry. I'm just, <laughs> that's, uh, the coffee's a little bit acidic. Um, I didn't want you to be too worried. But either way, when I started realizing that it was beneficial to myself, if I actively found ways to forgive people, and to let go of things. When I found out that I could benefit from that and I started looking for different ways I could do that or identifying different ways I could do that because I kind of had a natural ability after I recognized the importance. One of the ways is compassion and empathy. Um, it's very difficult for some of us to empathize with those that hurt us. It's very difficult to love thy enemy for many of us. 
and it's understandable because we uh, it's part of what keeps us alive is to be is to have some aversion from things that have brought us pain in the past but n not to change what you do but to have the empathy and the compassion to recognize that someone who hurt you is often hurting themselves someone who has gone through abuse is much more likely to abuse you to recognize that someone who has been abused in the past is more likely to abuse you as well. And it perpetuates a cycle of abuse where hate begets hate, negativity begets negativity, and evil begets evil. And once again, I want to say this. It, I, I don't want to say for you, for whatever situation that you're thinking of, that you have to forgive someone because I don't know the situation. I don't know the situation and it's just not my place to tell you that you have to do that. But if we're able to, if we deploy compassion and empathy and we think, well, this person was doing this and it was very wrong, but we understand the reason why they do that is because they were hurt in the past. And in my experience, that's really what starts the healing process for forgiving those that have hurt us and for moving on beyond that and continuing to thrive and be better overall. Because holding on to that anger I'm sure at this point you've recognized that a lot of, or you've thought that a lot of religions have touched upon this. Christianity talks about forgiveness and the importance of forgiveness. I believe Buddha said something like, holding a grudge and being angry at someone is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. <laughs> but either way, this is something that's helped me a lot. And I don't know how long this video is. I'll have to look at it when I'm editing. But these were two experiences, one relatively small and one very big, one very important of ways where I thought someone was wronging me, where someone was definitely wronging me, and how by trying to feel love, compassion, and empathy for the people that have wronged me has ultimately improved me as a person, kind of freed me from these chains of focusing on this so I can focus on the future and made me better overall and made life more enjoyable. So that's really the message that I want to share today. Thank you so much for listening. I said this was a short one, but the sun has set but it sets pretty quickly, so I don't know how long it is. But either way, thank you so much for listening. I am your brother Hampton from Hybrid Calisthenics. Have a beautiful day.